right, that's great. Welcome to the all members meeting on electoral reform. We have we have two guest speakers. We're here. We have uh, Maria Iacovu. Is that how you say it? Iacovu yes. uh, from the Labour campaign for electoral reform. And we also have Joe Susek. Is that correct? Susek. And yes. that, and he's from Make Votes Matter, which is all, and also a member of the executive of the Labour campaign for electoral reform. Um, they're going to give us a presentation on the different variations on, of proportional representation. Some of these we already know because they operate in many countries already. In fact, they operate in most countries. But they're very different and they have different outcomes for people in, in the amount of proportional representation they give and also in the direct election of their constituents. Right, uh, Maria and Joe, can I hand over to you? Thank you ever so much for inviting us. Um, and it will be really great, I think, because obviously you're from all over the world. As you said, Anne, many of you will be living in countries that have uh, proportional representation systems. So we'd be really interested to hear from you about your perceptions of how they work. In terms of how um, Joe and I are proposing to split this up. I will go first and I just have a few slides so I'm going to share my screen if somebody can just enable the screen sharing um, and I will talk a little bit about different electoral systems and I will say a little bit as well about the case for moving away from first past the post um, and then Joe will take it up later and we'll talk about um, know more about that but also about the state of the campaign within the UK Labour Party. Is that okay? Anyway, very glad to be here. I'm going to attempt now to share my screen. As, you, as um, you're getting that going Maria, um, I'll just say we usually where we'll have a CLP meeting we'll be passing around a clipboard with sign-up sheets on it at this point which um, obviously we can't do in this case but I am going to post a, uh, a link in the chat which is our virtual clipboard. And um, if you'd like to hear more from um, both campaigns, um, from Make Votes Matter and Labour Campaign for Electoral Reform, then please do sign up. And um, I think we're also offering six months free LCR membership at the moment. Okay, thanks Joe. Oh, go on, go on. No, I was handing back, go ahead, Maria. Oh, okay. So this is me again. So can you see now a little slide with part one geography on? So I used to be a teacher and I kind of miss that really. So when I talk about electoral reform, I like to give a few little different subject areas. So I start with geography. And actually you guys probably don't really need to, you know, you probably know this already, but I often will start by asking the audience if they know how many countries in the world actually use proportional representation. And this is quite interesting in the context of the UK because, you know, they've heard of Israel, they've sometimes heard of Italy or Belgium or something, but they'll, you know, normally say a sort of rather low percentage. And in fact, of course, the advantage, the, the, the truth is that many more countries use systems of proportional representation than do first past the post. So this is a slide of the countries that use first past the post. And at first glance, it looks like quite a lot of the world uses first past the post. But of course, if you get rid of the, U of the US and Canada, which come up very big on the map, you'll see that very few countries actually still use first past the post. And if anyone is old enough to remember the old maps of the British Empire that used to be coloured in red for the British Empire, it kind of looks quite a lot like that. Now there are some countries of the old British Empire that used to have first past the post by um, the British and that have moved away from that now. So we've got New Zealand, we've got Australia, we've got South Africa that ditched first past the post when it at the same time that it ditched the apartheid government. We've got Ireland which obviously was much longer ago than that. But moving back to the previous map and it's interesting, I think, to look at those two big countries there at the, on the left. We've got Canada and the United States. Now, what's interesting about those is that the, what you've got in the United States 
is you have got Donald Trump um, into the fifth year of his presidency now. And of course, you know, he won the election five years ago, but he didn't win the popular vote. He won, you know, a couple of percentage points less votes than Hillary Clinton. And, you know, that is a very stark, um, a, a stark example of how you can get really quite a, you know, an extreme government um, that does not really represent the popular vote cast. Uh, so that's the USA. Canada is interested because you have Justin Trudeau, who the last but one time he was elected, actually was elected on a pledge to reform the first past the post voting system. He said, this is going to be the last election that is fought in Canada under first past the post. And then of course they won and it turns out that it wasn't. Um, and I think that is a lesson for us campaigning for proportional representation in the UK in the context of the Labour Party to actually be very much aware of. And, you know, to know that sometimes it does take a few goes because even a party that is committed to the principles of proportional representation, once they get in under first past the post and they get a nice majority under first past the post, sometimes it is a difficult thing for them to do. Anyway, here's the geography lesson. The sort of take home message of that is that first past the post is not a thing that's everywhere. It's a thing that it's in a few places. And it is very much everywhere that it is around the world. It is the legacy of the British Empire. So moving on to history now. History was always my absolute worst subject at school. So this is the sort of history of the electoral system in, the, in Britain. And so, you know, in the very olden days, it was a feudal system, you had the king and then, you know, the barons and the nobles and everything sort of, you know, the king consulted them if he had to. In 1341, you had the House of Lords and the House of Commons sitting separately, but there was really no representation for ordinary people. In 1701, um, Parliament was, For the past, the post was sort of thought of, was invented. You know, this is this is when it happened. Now, it's at that time there was no set definition of who could vote of an electoral register, and in every constituency, it was it was done differently. And basically, it was very much in the pocket of rich and powerful people, and they sort of decided, you know, what was what. Then. Think so. 1701 is the birth of first past the post. And it was a very bad system indeed, the electoral system, very bad indeed, for all sorts of reasons, which have gradually, one by one, been flung away. So, um, you, you know, I, one of the few things I remember about my history lessons in primary school was rotten boroughs and pocket boroughs. So, rotten boroughs are the ones with no electors in, and pocket boroughs were constituencies, you know, controlled by one person. They got abolished by the 1832 Reform Act. And, you know, and then they started allowing all men with what was then quite a stringent property qualification to vote. So that's the first lot of the 1701 Act thrown away. Then um, in 1918, the vote was extended to all men over the age of 21 and to some women. So a bit more was chipped away. And then in 1928, women were able to vote on the same terms of men. In 1969, so, you know, bit by bit, that Act of 1701, which laid the foundations for democracy, that <laughs> was kind of pretty awful, really. All of those things, they've been chucked out one by one by one. And the only thing left standing is the first past the post electoral system. And this is my argument, really, for anybody who says, well, we've always had first past the post. You know, if you said, well, we've always had this thing, then we would still have rotten boroughs. You know, you have to get rid of things that are not very good. And I think it's time for that last bit of the 1701 Act, which serves Britain very, very poorly, time to go. Right, history lesson's over. Let's move on to maths. Now, you don't really need to be very clever at maths to realise that first past the post is um, quite bad in lots and lots of ways. So if you think back to the 2019 election uh, in the UK, uh, the Conservatives got a bit under 44% of the votes and they got 56% of the seats. Now, 
you know, in a way, that's just a difference in percentages. So, you know, why does that matter? And of course, the reason that it matters is that the Conservatives now have an 80 seat majority in the House of Commons. And the government is therefore, it's incredibly difficult to hold the government to account. And, you know, we see it's not just unfair, it's actually dangerous with their complete mishandling of the coronavirus crisis. You know, the opposition can kind of say all the right things and can, can do its best to point out the government's mistakes. But when you have a government with this huge majority, there is very little in practical terms that can be done to um, hold the government to account. So this graphic is not mine. It's, um, it was pinched from um, the Conversation website, which is great, actually. And as well as showing what happened in the UK system, it also shows um, what would have happened if the election had been run under the Dutch system and under the German electoral system. And in both cases, um, the Conservative Party would have had well under 50% of the seats, would not have had a majority, would have had to go into coalition with another party, and it would have been easier to hold the government into account. So this is the math that kind of shows us that really, um, you know, first past the post is not fair to political parties. It's interesting as well to see the effect on voters. So here we've got, um, I think it's 100 voters. 100 random voters, and let's see what First Past the Post does for them. Well, the first thing is that First Past the Post, um, because people's, a lot of people's votes don't count under First Past the Post. If you live in a safe seat, really your vote doesn't count. So there's a lot of apathy, and we have about 15% of people that are not registered. And it is very clear that the more non registered people you have, the more that favours the right. People who don't register to vote tend to be people who have less power in other areas. So in the UK, we have 15% of people not registered. Out of those who are on the electoral roll, you then, and again, this varies from election to election. Um, and I think this is calculated actually on the 2015 election figures, but it doesn't vary all that much. A 30 something percent don't vote. That's just out of the people that are registered to vote. So you can see already a large block of people are kind of cut out of the elections. Then again, in a system which like um, first past the post, when there's a lot of safe seats and there's a lot of people who know that their vote won't count, many people vote tactically. They don't vote the party they support, they vote the party that is most likely to beat the party that they hate the most. And the, the best estimate of that is about one in five people who cast a vote cast it tactically. Now, you know, this isn't necessarily a completely wasted vote, but it is a vote for a party that the person doesn't support. So again, this is another sense in which the system isn't quite right. Then you've got loads of people who voted for losing candidates in seats that were completely unwinnable and arguably those votes are wasted as well. And that's at least 28% of votes. Now you can see here from this graphic that that does, some of those are votes that were cast tactically as well. So, you know, we mustn't double count those. But what you can see from this is that elections in the UK are decided really by a minority of voters. You know, lots and lots of wasted votes. So that is another reason, while we're still sort of on the math lesson, while, you know, why first past the post, it doesn't just serve parties poorly, but it serves voters poorly. So we can identify a range of problems with first past the post. We can identify, you know, that it leads to voter apathy, it's a lot of wasted votes, it leads to tactical voting, and it leads to results that are unfair both to voters and to parties. Now, actually, there is some debate about the extent to which um, for, which first past the post is unfair to the Labour Party. So first past the post is clearly unfair to small parties. It's clearly unfair to the Green Party, to the Liberal Democrats and so on. Um, 
But there's a question about whether it's unfair to the Labour Party, because actually, you know, Labour is one of the two big parties in the UK. And when Labour wins, such as during the Blair years, actually, Labour did get a leg up from First Past the Post. But um, I would argue that First Past the Post is still unfair to the Labour Party. And that is because of the way that the, the, the left wing vote is split. The right wing vote is never really split. I mean, sometimes people, you know, vote for UKIP or the Brexit party, but when push comes to shove, those parties stand down. And it's actually the left of centre vote that time and time again is split. And that is one reason why the left tends to perform more poorly in the results than it does in the votes. Okay, these are the problems with first past the post. So, you know, another question that we can ask is, well, is there anything good about first past the post? I've told you all the things that are terrible about first past the post, but is there anything that is good about it? And here are some arguments that people sort of over the years have given. And some people, now this first argument, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's something that people used to say, you know, up to 10 or five years ago. But I think, you know, we can now really say no, it, you know, we, things are broken. Things are very, very bad in the political culture in the UK. Another interesting um, argument is that it, it, that first past the post excludes extremists such as UKIP or latterly, I haven't updated this, the Brexit party. And it is absolutely true. I'd be interested to know what you guys think about this actually. But it is absolutely true that in the UK, a party to the right of the Conservatives have only ever, um, I think, won one seat in Parliament. But I would argue that actually UKIP and later, latterly the Brexit Party have driven the agenda of the Conservative Party so much because the Conservative Party is terrified of people sort of defecting to those parties that actually it makes these far-right voices very, very powerful, even though they are never actually elected. Another thing that people say is, well, you know, big majorities, we're just sort of griping because we're the main party and we lost. And actually, we quite like a big majority when we win. And it's only, we're only saying this now because we've lost. Actually, I've, I've seen, I don't know why I've given this half a point, but I think there is an argument that huge majorities are actually not very good for any party. And, you know, there are a number of people who think, well, actually, it was lovely to have Labour governments when we had them. But Tony Blair did have some enormous overall majorities and quite possibly it was not the best thing for the Labour Party. Anyway, we can talk about that. There are a couple of arguments that people make about First Past the Post, which I think are worth bearing in mind. One is that it is simple. So in First Past the Post, you know, you go to the polling station and you're able to put one cross in one box. And that is very simple and everybody can do it. Um, I do think there's an argument for keeping any other, any future voting system that we have simple, but I would argue that possibly it doesn't have to be quite as simple from the perspective of the user that first past the post. And finally, this last one is the one that I think is probably most important for the UK. I am fully aware that in most countries around the world, there's, you know, they don't have a constituency link. You know, um, governments are elected off regional lists and, um, you know, and, and the notion of a constituency MP is just not, something that most people are bothered about but I think in the UK we have to start from where we are and um, and most people are used to having a local constituency MP who they think of as theirs even though they might not have voted for them that will do casework for example on their behalf and even though I fully acknowledge that there are many different ways that you could organize um, you know, that, that you could organise your elections and the way that people are represented. I think in the UK, we have to start from a situation where people, and in particular, of course, MPs, would be very reluctant to move away from this. 
So anyway, here is my verdict on first past the post. Basically, couldn't be worse. Really unfair, gives people terrible incentives. Any type of test that you could give a voting system, it fails. Um, you know, you could hardly invent a worse voting system if you tried. So what can we do instead of first past the post? So I'm going to talk here about two voting systems, which I think are not really goers for the UK, but, you know, we'll just mention them anyway. The first one is called the alternative vote. And this is the system that the 2011 referendum in the UK was based on. So the alternative vote isn't a proportional system and it's organised as follows. It's single member seats just like first past the post. The country is kind of divided into constituencies and the ballot papers with the alternative vote, they look identical actually to the ballot papers that you would get under first past the post. I think I have an example for you in a minute. And then um, when you get your ballot paper, it's different because instead of just marking a single cross on your ballot paper, so this is an example here, you don't put a cross against your favourite candidate, you put a number one against your favourite candidate and if you want, you could just not vote for anybody else, you know, post it in the ballot box and have done with it. So here, the number one is voted for the Labour candidate, but we could say, okay, you know, number two, I'm going to vote for the Green. Number three, I'm going to vote for the Lib Dem. Number four, I'm going to vote for the Independent. And, you know, we could leave it like that, put it in the ballot box. Or we could say, okay, number five, I'm going to vote for the Common Good Party. Number six, you know, well, I don't like the Conservatives or UKIP. They, again, I haven't updated this now that UKIP's gone, but... You know, number six, I don't like the Conservatives or UKIP very much, but really I prefer the Conservatives to UKIP if I have to make that choice. So I will mark them six or seven. So you could do that as well. So this is the sort of essence of preferential voting, that instead of just getting a ballot paper that you put an X in one box, you can rank the candidate. And then what happens is, oh, I think I have to go back here, sorry about this, if any candidate gets over 50% of the vote, they're in. If, on the other hand, there's no candidate that gets over 50% of the vote, then the bottom candidate drops out and the people that voted for them, their second preferences are distributed among the other candidates. And if, any, if one of them now gets 50%, they're in. If not, the next least popular candidate gets in and so on and so on. Now, actually, you've um, probably recognize this as the system that we use to elect the leader of the Labour Party in the UK. And actually, it's an excellent system, I think, for electing the leader of the Labour Party. But the situation there is that we're electing one person. And it's a, it's a great method for electing one person. However, when you are electing lots and lots of MPs in lots of different constituencies, the results could be just as bad as they are, just as unproportional as they are under first past the post. So in my opinion, it really, you know, it gives voters a little bit more choice. It also does encourage positive campaigning because the candidates always have to think not only about who's going to put their number one, but they have to encourage people that vote for other parties to put their number two. So you don't want to slag off your other your opponents too much because you want their second preferences so you know there are some things that are good about the alternative vote but in my opinion if we're going to do all the work to get a better voting system for the UK it's not really worth just sort of saying you know just stopping at the alternative vote because really it isn't very good so my verdict on the alternative vote is that that it is a slight improvement on first past the post but it's not really worth the effort okay that's the alternative vote then the next kind of family of voting systems that i would suggest are not really suitable for the uk are 
voting systems that are based on national or regional lists. Now, many of you will be familiar with those because they will be operating in the country that you live. And in fact, list systems are the most popular systems all over the world. Most countries elect their governments on list systems. So there's actually nothing wrong with them. But just for the UK, because we are so used to having this constituency link, you know, this link between a local MP and their constituents, I think it would be very difficult to get this through Parliament. And that is why I would say that this is not really a goer for the UK. So <clears throat> under list systems, every party that's contesting the election produces a ranked list of candidates. And these ranked lists can be produced in many ways. It could just be the party hierarchy in an office somewhere deciding they could consult their members. It's done in different ways in different places. Sometimes it's a national list. There's just one list for the whole country. Sometimes parties produce lists for the different re regions. Voters then vote for the party they prefer and the seats are allocated on the basis of the vote share. And basically, you know, if a, if a party got, say, 35% of the vote, they would get 35% of the seats. And those 35% those of the seats would be chosen from the party's top candidate. Now, I've said here that lists may be open or closed. What do I mean by that? Well, in some countries, there is nothing that voters can do to change the order of candidates on their party's list. If you vote for a party, you just say, okay, I'm voting for that party, and you leave it to the party to decide who are their top candidates. So one example of that is Israel, um, which is a closed national list. And I really like this picture, actually, of an Israeli um, polling booth. So in Israel, the official language is Hebrew, but many people because there's immigration from all over the world, many people can't speak Hebrew and they can't read or write Hebrew. So every party also has a symbol. And instead of having to sort of read a ballot paper, if you're voting, you just pick one paper from a box, you put it in an envelope, put it in the, um, and then you put it in the ballot box. So that's an example of a closed national list. Iceland also has closed national lists, quite a small country. But, and you see, you just vote for one of the parties and the candidates and the ordering of the candidates is listed below. But the Australian Senate, they have open lists. And so here, sorry, this isn't a, the reproduction on this isn't great. But for the Australian Senate, you can either vote um, just for the party and you can say, OK, I'm voting for the party and I will let the party decide the ordering of the candidates or I can vote in a more sort of um, sophisticated way and I can I can order the candidates within the party. Okay so those are list systems and my verdict on list systems is that they are the best systems in terms you know there's no doubt that in, if you want a proportional outcome where seats match votes then list systems are the best systems essentially. They are a great system for proportionality. And because of that, they give voters all the right incentives on election day. They're also very common across the world. Um, you do hear quite a lot about poorly designed list systems leading to a big proliferation of small parties, unstable coalitions, um, you know, countries being left without a government for months or sometimes even years or having to have lots of elections. Um, but in any case, the bottom line for me is that the loss of the constituency link, that list systems uh, means that you can't have really, you know, they're, they're not a viable system for the UK. So you might be thinking at this point, well, you know, what can we have if we can't have alternative vote and we can't have list systems? And the next two systems that I'm going to show you are systems that definitely would be goers for the UK. So the first one is the single transferable vote. So um, this is used for national elections in Ireland. It's also, I think, it's used in Malta. 
and in several places um, for local elections. And so what happens in um, under single transferable vote is that instead of having small single member constituencies like we do in the UK, we have larger multi-member constituencies. And those constituencies um, in Ireland, for example, the multi-member constituencies have between three and five members. So in urban areas where the constituencies are smaller anyway, they would have five members. And in rural constituencies where people are more spread out, they would have only three. Um, and in a four seat constituency, this is, this is how it goes. A four seat constituency is just an example here. Every party can stand up to four candidates. Often they might choose to stand fewer candidates, but they would stand you know, their candidates, and then you would get quite a big ballot paper because it would have all the candidates that every party was standing. And then, as a voter, you have to rank all of the candidates. Um, and again, you could decide that, you know, you've got a party that you like, so you're only going to vote for those candidates, um, one, two, three, four, in the order that you like them. On the other hand, you could say, well, OK, that's my party, but this party is my next favourite party. I'm going to vote for their candidates as well. You know, you can rank as many or as few as you like. And then um, the counting of the single transferable vote elections is quite complicated. Uh, the first preferences are counted and candidates who get enough votes for one seat, they win a seat. And if they've won a seat and they've got some spare votes, then those spare votes are allocated to the candidates who haven't yet won a seat in, you know, using a sort of proportional formula. And then if enough people still haven't won, they count them all again and see if anybody else has got enough. If not, then they take, this is like the alternative vote, they take the candidate with the least votes, reallocate their votes and so on and so on until you've got all the people that have won. So this is what a ballot paper for the single transferable vote can look like here. And so in this example, you've got a Labour voter who has just, who has um, marked their ballot paper one, two and three for the Labour Party candidates and who hasn't voted for anybody else. So that's what you can do. Alternatively, um, you can vote for more candidates. So this person has now voted for a few independent candidates in addition to the Labour candidates. Um, this person has decided to use all of their votes. So, for example, has put the Conservatives last and has put the Scottish Nationalists kind of next to last and so forth. So, verdict on the single transferable vote. Um, the Irish love their voting system because they say, well, it really gives them a lot of choice, you know, because you are not only choosing a party, but you are also able to, to reorder the candidates within the party that you like. And I think many of us, when casting our vote, you know, we might cast a vote for the party that we like, but we really don't like the candidate very much. Um, either, you know, we may not, even though they're a member of that party, we might not like their politics very much. Alternatively, you know, there are some candidates who might not be very effective or who we might suspect of corruption or something. And so, uh, you know, the single transferable vote does give people a huge amount of flexibility to put up the list candidates that they think are really good and not to vote for candidates that they think are problematic. It retains the constituency link. Obviously, the constituencies are bigger than they have now in the UK, but you know, there is an element of sort of localism. The single transferable vote is also broadly proportional. It's much more proportional than first past the post. Although I think it's worth saying that in a country where you do have several small parties, it may not be proportional enough, for example, in the UK, to give the Green Party enough seats. So, you know, proportionality is a little bit in question with STV. Um, many people think that STV would be a great choice for council elections in the UK because you have this sort of natural multi-member constituencies 
anyway, but certainly STV is a goer. But, you know, I think there are some problems with STV that we would have to think about very carefully before putting STV as our sort of preferred choice of system for the UK. And in particular, whether it is proportional enough, but it's certainly a good candidate. Finally, there's a sort of family of electoral systems that are usually referred to as additional member systems, although they can sometimes be referred to as mixed member systems. And um, this system, for example, you have it in Germany. Um, so basically, and also um, for the Scottish and Welsh assemblies. So when you're voting in an additional member system election, typically, although not invariably, because you couldn't, I have to say that additional member systems are the systems that are most flexible. There are many variants of the additional member system that you could have, depending on how, you know, what you wanted your electoral system to do and what you wanted it to look like. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, but usually a voter will fill in two ballot papers. So I'm just gonna give you an example. So this is the German ballot paper and on the left, you would put a single cross against the person um, for, for your constituency MP. And then on the right, you would put a cross against the party that you wanted to form a government. And you can see here that there are some parties, you know, there are more parties listed down the right hand side of the form than there are down the left hand side of the form. Um, and that's because not all parties contest all constituencies. You know, they may be trying to pick up their seats at the national level. So this is an example of, this is the a German ballot paper. And here, this is a Scottish ballot paper. So again here, uh, but the, it's the other way around. So the pink bit, you would vote for your constituency member, you would put a little cross in the box. And then on the yellow bit on the left-hand side, you put a cross in the box, for the party that you kind of want to form the government. Often that will be the same party, but it won't always be. So you fill in typically two sides of the same ballot paper. And then what happens is that, um, first of all, the ballot papers for the constituency MPs are counted. Do you know what? I actually forgot to tell you something about this first. So, We've got the additional member system, and basically there's two types of MP in an additional member system. There are constituency MPs, which are just like we have now in the UK. And then there's another level of MPs, which are sometimes called kind of top-up MPs or regional MPs or additional members. That's where um, the system gets its name from. And the function of these additional members is that, you know, the, the, there's an election that is held in constituencies. Constituency MPs are elected and then, just like first past the post, the result will not be proportional. The seats will not reflect the votes cast and the function of the additional members is to allocate more members of parliament to sort of top up the numbers of seats that the parties have who were not served well by the first round to make the system more proportional. So I should have said that at the beginning. So when you're voting on this, you have two ballots, one for your constituency MP and one for the sort of regional or national MPs that will be elected to top it up. The constituency votes are counted first and the constituency MPs are allocated just like under first past the post. And all those results are announced and it always isn't proportional. And then, they, so there will be parties that have a shortfall in the number of MPs that they have. So for example, in the UK, um, almost certainly the Lib Dems would have not had enough MPs. Almost certainly the Green Party would not have had enough MPs. Most likely the Brexit Party would also be due some additional members and so on and so on. And um, then the second 
lot, the second tier of votes would be counted and extra seats would be allocated to uh, those parties to sort of even things up so that um, the number of seats that every party had was more similar to the number of votes that had been cast. Now, I started off saying that the additional member systems are extremely flexible. So you can design an additional member system in many different ways. So the German system is designed so that it actually is very proportional indeed. You end up with result because there's a lot of additional members. And likewise, the New Zealand system, in the New Zealand system, there's a lot of additional members. And so um, the election results in New Zealand tend to be quite proportional. In the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Parliament, by contrast, there's a smaller proportion of top-up MPs. So the process of sort of topping up the results does mean that the systems are more proportional, the results are more proportional, but they fall short of full proportionality. And it is possible to design a system to achieve the degree of proportionality that you want. And that's, some, you know, the exact degree of proportionality that we want from a system is something that we could talk about later. So the verdict on AMS is that it is a flexible system. You can make it really do what you want. For the UK, it may provide the best balance between a constituency link on the one hand and a high degree of proportionality on the other. The other thing which I think is in favour of the additional member system for the UK is that it is gen it's working well. It, you know, it's already been introduced in the London Assembly, in the Welsh Assembly, in the Scottish Assembly, and the sky hasn't fallen in. People know how to use it. It's worked pretty well. Um, so all of these are sort of marks in favour of the additional member system. The one thing that some people don't like about the additional member system is that all MPs are not equal. There are sort of two different tiers of MP. You've got your local constituency MP and then you've got your sort of regional and national or national MP. Um, and again, that's something that, that we can talk about, but definitely the additional member system is a strong contender for a new voting system for the UK. And I think this may just possibly be my last slide. Yes, I've got a few, I've got a few more little graphs here, but I'm not going to show them to you now. So thanks very much to listening for listening. And I'm now going to hand over to Joe.